Hi guys, in this episode I am going to continue with the proof of this uh, claim that we uh, previously made and then I'll talk about lexicographic preferences and then finally De Bros uh, uh, famous theorem. All right, so um, remember our uh, purpose was the following. The very simple example we talked about is like three example and then I showed you that it is very easy to generate a utility function representing that preference relation. But the question was, can we generalize this uh, uh, conclusion for any x and for any preference relation? Well, here what we are fixing is that the, the binary relation must be a preference relation, meaning it's a complete transitive and reflexive. Well, if this is the case, well then, if x is also finite, then uh, the preference relation has a utility representation. And in fact, uh, the utility numbers can be natural numbers because X is a finite set. However, this conclusion, I mean, every binary, every preference relation can be represented by a utility function is not always true if the domain of preferences is, 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 is not finite. And lexicographic preferences is very one nice example for this. I'm not going to prove, at least in this episode, that the lexicographic preferences are, uh, I cannot be represented by a utility function, but the proof is not too complicated. Um, and, and, and the proof also available on Ariel Rubinstein's lecture notes. And actually, if you just Google it, you will be able to find the proof of this argument. And then finally, I'm just going to talk about the, uh, the Rose theorem. Uh, I'm not going to define the continuity of preferences because it's a highly technical, at least for this course. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll argue and we'll, we'll talk about it. Okay, so let's start proving this argument. So I have a preference relation. I know it's a binary relation with complete transitive and, 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 and reflexive uh, properties. X is a finite set. Well, then how can I create this utility function? Uh, well, it's sort of very similar to the way we created utility function for the three uh, alternative example. So let's start with defining a set X1. X1 is basically the set uh, with the uh, 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 the preference minimal alternative in it. All right, so I have the preference relation, right? So according to this preference relation, I know that there's a minimal alternative and the maximal alternative. So whatever this minimal alternative is, pick this minimal alternative and put it into my set X1, all right? There might be more than one such minimal alternatives, maybe, right? Because this preference relation is not strict, I'm sorry, may, do not have to be strict. Well then, put all those such X uh, alternatives into this set X1. Well, first thing, I know that this set is non-empty, right? So X1, is non-empty. How do I know that? Well, remember, we just argued previously that every uh, preference relation is going to have the worst and the best alternative if the set of uh, uh, alternatives is finite. Very well. Um, well, what else? Um, we know that this is non-empty. Very good. So let's consider this set. Um, all right, so x minus x1, meaning exclude those worst alternatives. Look at this one and then define x2, which is the, the minimal or the worst alternatives, alternatives, all right, maybe there's more than one in x minus x1. All right, so I excluded the worst alternatives, x1s, and so uh, from the remaining set of alternatives, what's the worst? Again, I know that x2 is non-empty. Why is that so? Well, I mean, it can be empty if because all the alternatives are uh, the worst, but that can't be, right? I mean, if, all, if, if everything is worse, there must be something dominating them in a, in a way. So therefore, x2 can be empty. The, uh, um, I'm sorry, x, x2 cannot be empty for that reason. Um, so, so it's non-empty, we know that. And so basically continue this way, define x minus 
uh, uh, x1 union x2, all right? So then define x3 with the minimal alternative, minimal alternatives in x minus x1 union x2. So I, I eliminated all the, uh, you know, the worst, the second worst, and then now I am defining the third worst and so on, all right? So define this until xn. Well, the thing is if x1 union x2 all the way union xn gives me the uh, the mother set x, well, then I'm fine. I'm, I'm, I'm finished. I, I, I'm done. But the thing is, if this is not the case, meaning if x is, well, this will never be greater than, uh, I'm sorry, superset of x. This may be subset of x. In that case, that means I haven't finished yet. So keep going. I mean, that means define x n plus one n plus two. The thing is, the cardinality of x, we know that this is finite. So therefore, this step is going to finish at some m, which is finite, all right? This is a, a natural number, by the way. It has to stop at some finite step. Very well. So let's suppose this is m is the point where we stop. So I have x1, x2, all the way xm. So uh, the construction is easy. So define u of x, all right? For example, uh, uh, one, remember, so two is greater than one. So u of x is equal to one if x is in x1, all right? In fact, u of x is equal to k if x is in xk. So you know what, what happened? All the alternatives in this set, they are, their utility is one. All the alternatives in this set, their utility is, is two. And all the alternatives in this set, their utilities are m. And so they have the highest utility and these are the lowest utility. And you know what? That represents this preference relation. Uh, we need to show that, but I'm, I'm gonna skip this step. Um, so intuitively it does represent the uh, preference relation because remember these are the worst alternatives. So everything in, the, in, in this part, all the alternatives in those sets are better than this one. So if this preference relation is representing this binary relation, that means all the alternatives, all these alternatives, utility must be greater than the utilities uh, uh, of the alternatives in this set, which is the case because their utilities are one and so on. So therefore this utility function does represent uh, the binary relation. Well, here you don't have to give the utility one, you can just multiply it by any constant number, but you have to multiply uh, the same constant number with all the other numbers as well. So it's a sort of strictly increasing transformation of the utility function. That V function uh, is also going to represent the preferences. All right, so that's how we prove this argument. Okay, so next is lexicographic preferences. So the, uh, the lexicographic preferences are actually uh, 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 pretty uh, uh, intuitive, although their, their definition is rather awkward. So let's consider the simplest environment where x is in fact uh, 0, 1 interval times 0, 1 interval. So it's basically unit square. So we are in R2. All right, so this is zero one interval. This is zero one interval. So my alternatives are all in this set. So this is my X set X. So this box and the boundary is all included. All right, sorry. Um, so very well. So it says uh, this binary relation can be defined as follows. So a vector, right, in this world, an alternative is nothing but a vector, is at least as good as another vector, b1, b2, if and only if, this is a definition, uh, a1 must be strictly greater than b1, or if this is not true, meaning if, uh, for example, they are equal, well, then we must have a2 strictly greater than b2. Uh, well, you have to take some time to understand this definition, uh, I know. Some people say, well, what if A1 is strictly less than B1? Look, well, then that means uh, A1, B1 vector is not at least as good as B1, B2 if 
B1 is greater than A1. The opposite is going to be true, meaning B1, B2 vector is going to be at least as good as A1, A2. So this is a definition of A1, A2 at least as good as B1, B2. All right, so the first component of this vector must be strictly greater than the first component of the second vector. If they're the same, well, then you know what? The second components must be strictly greater, all right? Uh, greater than or equal to, in fact, yeah. Uh, because this is not a strict uh, preference relation. Um, well, if you think about it, this is basically how the uh, words uh, ranked in dictionaries, right? So, for example, when you consider apple versus um, access, so the apple is going to uh, be way earlier in the dictionary than access because, well, the first letters are the same, right? Because, I mean, for example, bicycle is going to appear all, all the way back to later pages because it starts with B. The dictionary first uh, 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 puts all the words starting with A and then B and then C, remember? So therefore, uh, so but if two words starting with A, well, then we're going to look at the second uh, uh, letter. So P versus X. So P appears earlier in English alphabet. So P appears earlier than X. So therefore, Apple has to appear earlier. So here, in the same sense, this uh, vector is at least as good as the second vector. We first compared the first alternatives. And if the first alternatives are the same, uh, right? Well, then we look at the second alternative. And in fact, with this intuition, you can extend this to uh, R, Rn to Rn. Uh, I'm sorry, a, 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 a binary relations on Rn. Okay, so this is a preference relation. Later, I will keep talking about this preference relation. Um, so one thing is that this preference relation uh, cannot be represented by a utility function. Okay, well, why is that? Well, first of all, the domain of this preference relation, so this domain is not finite. There are infinitely many and count uncountably many uh, alternatives in this set, all right? So therefore, you cannot be use the proof or the approach that we you that we uh, used to prove this argument all right uh, meaning this idea of creating x1 creating x2 can't i apply this logic here all right well very good question so x1 is the set of alternatives uh, that are the worst hmm. well you know what you can probably say, well, why don't we start with 0, 0? Because it seems like the worst alternative, right? Because it gives you the 0 in both coordinates. Uh, very, very nice. Very nice. But what about... Uh, sorry, that was my Siri talking. I don't know why. So, um, for example, 0, uh, comma 0 0.5. Which one is better? Well, this is clearly better. So 0, comma 0 0.5 is better than 0, 0 because the first alternatives are the same and the second alternatives, this one is better. So this guy is at least as good as 0, 0. Very good. And in fact, uh, 0 0.70, 0, for example, this is also at least as good as 0, 0. Why is that? Because the first alternative is, is higher, 0 0.7 is greater. So very well. Well, then that means it seems like the 0, 0 is at least one of the elements. In fact, it is one alternative in, in x1. Very good. So, but what about x2? So x2 is the worst alternative in the set 0, 1 squared, which is 0, 1 cross 0, 1 cross product, minus 0, okay? So now what is the worst alternative? Okay, so here is the problem. If you remember our discussions in math review, this is a, a domain which is not compact, all right? Meaning it's not closed, all right? It is bounded, but it's not closed, and so it's not compact. Once, once I don't have a compact, non-compact set, uh, 
uh, the minimum point or the maximum point may not exist, all right? Uh, even though the preference relation or the utility function or the function defined over this domain is continuous. So, because of, in the finite example, we didn't have this problem because once I subtracted alternatives in X1, the remaining set was always finite. And I know that the, in, within the finite set, there's always the worst and the best elements. But for a, 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 a continuum domain, meaning a domain with infinitely many alternatives, uh, once you exclude some alternatives, uh, you can't be sure that whether the min exists. And in this case, actually it doesn't. So X2 is not a well-defined, I can't say it's empty, all right, but it's not a well-defined set. So therefore this approach, this proof I used will not work to construct a utility function representing. But that's not the reason why this, I mean, that's not the proof of lexicographic preferences are not uh, 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 cannot be represented by a utility function. There might be millions of other ways of uh, constructing the utility function. Um, there's a, a definitely a more elegant proof. Uh, maybe in another episode I'm going to talk about it, but not this one. Okay, so one final point is, uh, still, can we say anything about uh, axis which is not finite? Well, yes, we can. Thanks to De Bruce's theorem, he says, look, if your preference relation, which is a binary relation that is complete, transitive, and reflexive, if your preference relation is on top of all these three, continuous, and X is a metric space, uh, that's important because continuity and you know, all the other stuff can be defined only on metric spaces. Uh, X is a, a metric, space with some uh, uh, appropriate metric. Well, then, therefore, this preference relation has a continuous utility representation. I mean, I can find a utility function, which is, by the way, continuous, lovely, that will represent my preference relation. But for this result to be true, my preference relation has to be continuous. And here, what does continuous preference means? Um, well, one um, logical deduction, well, therefore my lexicographic preferences are not continuous, right? If they were continuous, well, then according to this theorem, I must have a utility representation. But because I don't have utility representation, well, one of those uh, parameters, uh, pr uh, premises must be false. And well, because X is a metric space, uh, well, then this preference relation must be discontinuous. And in fact, it is. Lexicographic preferences are not continuous preferences. Well, what is continuous preferences? Again, in this episode, I'm not going to define what it means, maybe in later episodes, but the continuous preferences and continuous functions are are, are very sort of related. Remember the continuous function, there is no jump. And same for the preference relation. So the preference relation is that A is better than B, B is better than C, C is better than D, and so on and so forth. So this preference relation all of a sudden will not be reversed. All right, all of a sudden will not be reversed. So although the differences between alternatives are very, very, very small, I prefer A to B, B to C, C to D, but all of a sudden, although, again, those alternatives are very close to one another, uh, you're, you, you cannot all of a sudden say, hey, look, a Volkswagen is better than an, an, uh, a Ferrari kind of argument. Uh, but here, what does that mean that the alternatives are very close to one another? Well, there you go. This is why we need the metric space, okay? So the bottom line is when you have uh, a preference relation, which is continuous, well then on any metric space, I can find some utility function that's gonna represent this preference relation. So uh, that's the good news.